So when we left off, the United States commitment in Vietnam had grown dramatically, as we said. We were throwing, I will not say the full weight of American firepower and, and capabilities at the enemy, but a large chunk of America's military and resources were being deployed. <clears throat> now, early on, for example, in 1965, when people were asked in a Gallup poll, which is the famous, highly reliable or trusted polling organization, when people were given a, a question about how they felt about Vietnam, in early 1965, polls showed that 66% of Americans approved our policy in Vietnam, our increased presence, upping the bombing, upping the troop deployments, the commitment, basically, you know, getting in there to win it. Now, as time went on, we're going to see that change, okay? And so what we're going to look at in Section 3 is we're going to we, – everyone probably has the stereotype of the Vietnam War protester. Most people have the image in their head. That was the war where only, you know, where a large chunk of America was wearing tie-dye and headbands and throwing up peace symbols and nobody wanted to go and everyone burned their draft cards. That did occur during Vietnam. That was not a majority of America during Vietnam. That was a small percentage of America, but there were some dramatic protests and that's why they are they are well remembered. We're going to look at all that, though. We're going to look at where that where that image comes from, where that idea comes from, why did it occur, things of that nature. Now, as the war drug on, one of the problems that we encountered was we were told we're winning, this is easy, it's almost over, a few more troops, a few more months, you know, we're winning, this is easy, repeat. And then we never won, Right. We kept hearing the enemy's done. We, we've got them defeated. They're on the run. They're going to surrender any day now. Six months later, I'm getting told the same thing. And it's the it's the age old. That's what you said six minutes ago or six months ago. And so your problem was General West. Excuse me, General William Westmoreland, the man in command of American troops in Vietnam. In the early years, he was giving press conferences or answering reporters' questions or you know doing interviews, and he would use phrases like the enemy's hopes are bankrupt he said that in 1967 he went on to say we've reached an important point where the end begins to come into view the famous expression was the light at the end of the tunnel we kept hearing about the light at the end of the tunnel how we could see it right how it was, how it was coming into focus that we were coming near the end of our journey so to speak now one of the problems you had is not only I kept hearing the same positive we're winning message and we didn't win the war, I also had contradictory evidence. Television. Vietnam is the first TV war in American history and, to be quite honest, history. We had reporters in the field reporting and, and streaming it back to the United States if not live, nearly live. The, the government could not filter and edit things like they used to be able to. There was all sorts of coverage of World War II. Obviously, because I showed you a bunch of those photos and, and there, are, there are film clips and all sorts of stuff. Combat photographers. You had, you had people in the military, that was their job. You also had reporters who were allowed to go with the boys, so to speak. You know, they, they, the AP, the Associated Press, would have a reporter go, or, or you know, Washington Post, whoever. You had a few, you had a few trusted outlets that were allowed to send reporters. But the thing is, their photos, their films, their reports, nothing could get published without censorship. The military got a first glimpse at it because you were there with the military, and the only way you got anything sent back was through military courier. So there was no broadcasting the signal right back home. That has all changed by Vietnam because of the advent of satellites and all sorts of other stuff. They could film something in Vietnam. They could then send it back to the TV stations in America, you know, in Los Angeles or San Francisco or wherever. 
And the government couldn't stop it. They couldn't control it. They couldn't truly filter it and prevent it from, from getting broadcast. And so what we got with Vietnam for the first time really in history is not only was, was we got to watch the war on TV. I mean, this is the first war where everywhere, everybody basically has a TV in their home and everyone's watching the nightly news coverage. But there's also the fact of it's, it's sort of raw and unfiltered and the military hasn't had a chance to kind of take out the parts they don't like. And so every night, so to speak, not every night, obviously, but a lot of nights they would. And now we we go to our in the field, you know, so and so what's his face. And next thing you know, there's this reporter and he's in a helmet and a flak jacket and he's squatted down and you can hear the gunfire in the background and you can see the troops running around in the background. He's talking about how they're where they are and what they're doing and how long they've been engaged. And all of a sudden you hear somebody scream medic and, you know, somebody runs by and he's clearly been shot and all sorts of stuff. The kind of stuff we weren't used to seeing, right? And so we're hearing how the enemy's defeated. And then every night I turn on the news, I see an enemy who's fighting back. Every night I see on the news an enemy that's inflicting casualties on American troops. For an enemy that was supposedly crushed, whose hopes were bankrupt, light at the end of the tunnel, all that stuff, I'm not seeing that in the nightly news coverage. I'm seeing a determined enemy, right? And so we saw the, the beginnings of what is called the credibility gap. The concept being, on one hand, you know, the government is telling us one thing, but our eyes and, and everything else is kind of telling us, do we believe the government? Do we trust what they are telling us and reporting to us? Congress, which, remember, gave the president basically the, the free hand with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, they actually began asking questions earlier than some Americans. As early as February 1966, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee had a number of what we term educational hearings where they wanted to know about what's going on in Vietnam. And, and what are we doing there, and what's our plan, and how's it going? Secretary of State Dean Rusk and other leaders in the administration had to testify. The committee also heard from, for example, George Kennan, who you might remember from Chapter 26, is the father of containment. George Kennan is the man who wrote the long telegram, which is the, the basis of the containment policy that we're supposedly enforcing in Vietnam. Kennan actually criticized what we were doing and said, look, Vietnam is not important. Vietnam is not containment. This is not, this is not the, the sort of thing I meant when I talked about containment. And we're actually doing ourselves more harm than good by fighting here. And so even George Kennan was a critic of Vietnam early on. Okay, But let's look at America early on. Early on in the war, it was supported. A lot of people believe we needed to be there, containment, fight communism. There was some early resistance early on, but not a lot. For example, in March of 1965, a group of teachers and students at the University of Michigan left their classrooms and had an impromptu teach-in uh, where they either occupied common areas or hallways and basically kind of had an informational discussion about what was going on in Vietnam, both both our end of it and historically what was the situation in Vietnam and do we belong there. In May of 1965, there was a nationwide or a national teaching day. It affected 122 colleges and universities across America. Now, <clears throat> why, do, why were people against the war in Vietnam? Because again, some of this stuff took a while to develop, right? I mean, in 1965, we started deploying combat troops to Vietnam in 1964. It's not like we've been there very long. Um, matter of fact, we started Operation Rolling Thunder in March of 1965. So America's real commitment to Vietnam had just begun. So why are people so opposed to it this early in the game? Well, there are some. there's a variety of reasons. First of all, some people saw Vietnam very differently than Korea, for example, they did not look at this as an invasion because it wasn't entirely an invasion um, that we were trying to fight off. Some people saw it as a civil war. And I'm one of those people who sort of agrees, looking back on it, it, it was more of a civil war than it was an attempt by communist conquest. You have to go back and remember 
Vietnam got its independence because of a revolution um, against the French, right? And they won. And at the peace treaty, they were told there would be a temporary division that would then be reunited a couple years later in an election, which never occurred because one side refused to have the election. That created the Viet Cong. That is what created the resistance and the rebellion in the South that the communists supported. And so there is a degree of this is this is an uprising, a civil war. This is a group of people who don't believe that the South's government is legitimate or that you know things are done right or fairly or however you want to say it. Um, so there is a degree of it is a civil war instead of just a communist invasion. Some people would point out the South Vietnamese government is corrupt. People are supporting the Viet Cong, not just because they're scared of the Viet Cong. Some people are joining the Viet Cong because they agree the South government is corrupt. It's full of corrupt cronies, and there's a lot of bribery, and there's a lot of nepotism, and you know tax dollars are swindled, and everybody's on the take, and everybody's embezzling. It's not a real democracy. You saw what they did to the Buddhists. You know why? Why are we going there to fight and save it? Why are we fighting for this this corrupt government, which, by the way, has gone through four military coups at this point? You know, it's just every time you turn around, it's, it's a new general who's going to quote unquote save Vietnam. So some people don't look at it as us fighting communism; they look at it as a civil war the Vietnamese need to figure out. Some people, of course, why would I go die for a, a government like the South Vietnamese government? Some people point out the draft system. <clears throat> The draft system was accused of being unfair. There is some truth to that back then. Okay, back then, gentlemen, the draft system did not, if you were enrolled in a university, you were exempted from the draft. So if you were in college, you could not be drafted. You basically were removed from the pool. Um, so that meant that basically only people who were not going to college were eligible for the draft. You have to remember that back then, the number of or the percentage of minorities that were able to attend college was very small. Because back then, guys, there weren't all of the ways to help pay for college there are today. You basically either could afford college or you couldn't. There weren't all these student loans and programs and grants and scholarships. It was just you either had it or you didn't. And so basically, poor kids couldn't go to college. And the bulk of America's minority groups were all in the lower income groups. Um, and so that meant that a disproportionate number of soldiers in Vietnam were from minority groups, especially African Americans. By 1967, African Americans had accounted for 20% of American combat deaths, which is twice their percentage of the American population. I actually have some final statistics I like to bring up at this point if we were at school and I did not dig that folder out of my filing cabinet before we went away. Um, but if you look at it, by the end of the Vietnam War, um, everyone's death rate was very close to their population percentage, um, or I, I shouldn't say death rate, percentage of casualties in Vietnam roughly correlates to percentage of the American population. I don't necessarily think that the statistic that your book is giving is wholly accurate, um, just because I think it would be really weird that they would be able to to shift that down so dramatically over the next couple of years. Um, but anyhow, there was um, definitely a discrepancy in the fact of college kids don't get drafted. They're the same age as low-income kids, but they don't get drafted. And so there was a call to change the system, and it was modified in 1969 the way it is now. A lotto system, right? You get your draft number. They pull numbers randomly. Good luck. If you're in college, you get to finish the semester. Then you go. Okay, you do not get to be on hold until you graduate. You have to finish the semester and then you will report. The theory being, you will wrap up whatever college courses you are currently taking, you will put your affairs in order, and you will go. That way, when you're done with your service, you can come back and resume college and there's not been a huge interruption um, in, in the process for you. You basically just put college on pause. 
that is the way it is now. Not that we're going to have a draft anytime soon, but if you were in college, you would, if you got drafted, they would let you finish whatever courses you were taking and then you would go. Now, <clears throat> that helps explain why people were uh, desperately trying to get into college during uh, the Vietnam War. And for those of you who are like, well, what happens when you graduate? Now you're eligible. Never graduate. Change your major. Keep going. Keep right. Find a way to stay enrolled. Find a way to stay enrolled. Um, I have uh, I had family members who enrolled in college um, to avoid the draft, failed out of college, and got drafted right after they failed out. Uh, that was that was like a real easy way to get drafted, really, because they they kept track of that. I don't know how random the draft was at times, but there were a lot of people. Man, the minute you failed out of college, you magically got drafted. Um, but yeah, I have family members had no plan at all, no idea what they were going to do, no reason to go to college, except they were trying to avoid the draft, so they went to college, but it didn't work out. Um, my father-in-law, actually, uh, was drafted during the Vietnam War. He graduated from high school in Louisville, Kentucky. He was taking some courses at a community college, nothing, nothing major, um, but he was taking some courses, and... As soon as he dropped down the number of courses to where he was no longer considered full time, it, it, it was just he wanted to be able to work more because he wanted to be able to earn some money and help out with the family business and things. So as soon as he stopped being registered as a full time college student, he became draft eligible. He got drafted almost immediately. OK, he didn't flunk out. He just he didn't take 12 credit hours and he was no longer considered a full time university student. He was drafted during the Vietnam War as soon as he was no longer enrolled um, completely. So another issue, um, <clears throat> and by the way, there were people who dodged the draft. There were people who fled to Canada um, because they just simply did not want to report where they would be drafted. And rather than report, they would flee to Canada and become fugitives who would eventually be forgiven. But um, one of the other issues is the fact of back then, 18-year-olds could be drafted, but they did not have the right to vote. Up until 1971, voting age in this country was 21, which, again, meant 18, 19, 20-year-olds could be drafted, could be sent off to go fight and die in Vietnam, but they did not have the right to vote. And so that is really a big reason why we passed the 26th Amendment. In 1971, the voting age in this country was lowered to 18 because the theory being, if you're old enough to be drafted to fight and die for America, I think you're old enough to handle the right to vote. Quick side note, and that's why I had a, a momentary pause a few moments ago, because I wasn't sure where I wanted to include it. And I talk about this in my American government course. Your draft card is a government document. When you register for the draft and you get your draft card in the mail, it is a government document. Purposely destroying that document is a crime. Okay? It is not considered an act of protest that is protected by the First Amendment. Burning a draft card, purposely destroying a draft card, is a federal crime. All right? People could be prosecuted for it, theoretically. Um, it is not the same as, you know, any other form of protest because it's not looked at as your property. It's looked at as a government document that is required or needed for the government to be able to hold a conscription system. You destroying that document is viewed as you interfering with conscription. And so it's considered a crime. Just a little tidbit I like to throw out there. Your draft card. Uh, if it were to get uh, accidentally thrown in the trash or something, I don't think the FBI is going to be kicking down your door. Um, but you definitely don't want to go on YouTube burning your draft card. Um, you you could get in trouble for that one. Also, I don't know why you would. No one's getting drafted. But anyhow, sorry. Gentlemen, this all starts to turn into the argument of hawks versus doves. Hawks, those who support the war in Vietnam. Doves, those who oppose the war in Vietnam. Okay. President Johnson is, of course, determined to continue the war, and the hawks are determined to continue the war. Yet a lot of hawks who accuse the doves of being just naive, 
um, you know, just a bunch of college kids who don't understand what what's at stake here, who don't understand the fight against communism. Um, you know, a bunch of pampered rich kids in college who don't understand what sacrifices have to be made to be, you know, they don't understand the reason they get to go to college because the generation before them went off and fought the Nazis and the Japanese and they didn't protest, you know. Um, the president wasn't alone. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows about the protesters. Everybody has seen the films. Everybody has, has you know, seen the footage of Woodstock. But here's an interesting tidbit that people don't realize. That's not the bulk of America. The bulk of America supported the Vietnam War. Okay? A poll taken in early 1968, 53% of people favored stronger action in Vietnam as opposed to 24% who wanted an end to the war. Um, <clears throat> and here you go. The, this shows you roughly the percentage of people who were supporting the war or supported the war in Vietnam, and it's broken by age group. And you will notice that the age group that, support, that supports the war the most is the youngest group, the under-30 crowd. Okay? The tie-dye, headband it's pot smoking, you know, listening to the doors. Yes, them. And I listen to the doors, too. I'm not in, implying anything. That crowd was the usually the most good-to-go gung-ho, right? It was the older crowd that was anti-Vietnam, mostly, right? Under 30 consistently was the most strongly supportive of the war in Vietnam, okay? Up until this point. 70%, 60%, right? Now, over here, you've got some high 50s and 60s and then low 50s. Over here, it only hits 50% a couple times. In 65, some of the older folks agreed with Vietnam, but the bulk of the older crowd did not agree with Vietnam. Okay? But you can see here, boys, the bulk of America supported the war in Vietnam. The bulk of America supported bulk, 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 up until, you know, here, right, 67, 68. That's when the wheels start to fall off, as we'll see here in a moment. Um, right about now is when I would usually ask my classes, why, right? Because when we think anti-communist, we think conservative, old school, you know, bite your lip and, and go off and fight for king and country. We think the older crowd. What's going on here? I don't have any proof, um, but I do have some theories. One, they've been there. <laughs> they've been to war. This is the World War II generation. These are the guys who went to Normandy and Iwo Jima and the wives whose husbands went off to Iwo Jima, right? You know, you think about it. In 1968, if you're an 18-year-old in 1968, you were born in 1950. Odds are your dad fought in World War II, right? Or maybe Korea. You know, these people went to Korea. They went to World War II. They've seen it, done it, and they know it's not, it's not glorious, it's not fun, and they're scared to lose their kids. They're scared to watch their sons go off and fight and die in that jungle. And again, if you were in Korea and you remember Korea, you are afraid Vietnam's going to turn into Korea 2.0. It actually went worse than Korea, but you're afraid it's going to be Korea. And so this was a war that was supported by the younger crowd up to a point. And then the wheels fall off. 1968 is the year that everything falls apart. Okay? First of all, there was the Tet Offensive. Let me explain. Tet is the Vietnamese New Year. Vietnam, like a lot of, of countries in East Asia, a lot of the what we would term Oriental countries, they celebrate things based on the lunar calendar. So they, they schedule things around cycles of the moon, etc. Um, and so they traditionally celebrate New Year's not on January 1st. You know, January 1st means nothing, if you think about it. We just randomly chose a day out of the 365 options to start the year over. There is no celestial reason that January 1st is New Year's. There's nothing unique in that moment in the Earth's orbit. Um, there is nothing unique necessarily in the cycle of the moon, which is why 
in the Asian countries, they use the lunar calendar because 12 moon cycles represents actually a, a completion of a year. So that's why they, they use the, the moon. But anyhow, their new year is called Tet. And for them, it is a huge holiday. But unlike us, it is not a holiday where you put on a dumb hat and you drink a lot of alcohol and then you mumble the words to a song you don't know the words to when the ball drops in Times Square. I don't like New Year's, in case you guys didn't know that. Um, I think it's silly. But anyhow, for the people of Vietnam, Tet is like a religious holiday. Um, you go to temple. You pray for the souls of your ancestors. Maybe you visit the graves of your ancestors and ask them to help you in the coming year. Um, you know, you spend time with family. It is not a big party. Now, that's not to say there aren't celebrations, that there aren't festivals, but it is not just a big everybody's going to go get, you know, intoxicated at so-and-so's. Um, it, is, it is more of a, a several-day-long kind of event. Huge festival and holiday in their culture. Well, Tet had traditionally been a ceasefire. The last few years, we and our enemies, um, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army, had declared a ceasefire the few days before and after Tet, so both the North and South Vietnamese could do it. This gave the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army a chance to celebrate Tet, and go see their families and pray at the graves of their ancestors or whatever. And it allowed our allies in South Vietnam the same opportunity. We wanted the people of Vietnam to celebrate their huge holiday. So every year there was a ceasefire for Tet. And there was another one scheduled for 1968. But this time the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army had planned a sneak attack. They had spent the weeks leading up to Tet getting prepared. And on the night of Tet, when a lot of the South Vietnamese Army, or actually the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, Arvin, as it was called, was on leave, when most Americans were having a barbecue and a beer in South Vietnam, because our guys thought, we have a few days, we're not doing anything. No missions, no bombing runs, no fighting. We're taking a break, we'll, you know, we'll cook some burgers, we'll play some cards, we'll just hang out. Nobody was ready for the sneak attack that occurred. The Viet Cong were able to overrun every single provincial capital and launched attacks in every major city in South Vietnam. They even attacked the American embassy located in downtown Saigon. Right? Everywhere. Every major hamlet, town, village, city. Every major military base was attacked. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the capital of South Vietnam, Saigon, they launched major attacks all over that city. Okay? Up here, the ancient capital of Hue, they overran that city. Um, they, ca they, they literally captured that city. <clears throat> a group of their fighters blew a hole in the wall that surrounded the American embassy, went into the American embassy and started shooting up the place. It took several hours for American troops to retake the American embassy in Saigon. Up near the border, near the demilitarized zone, there was an American military position called Quezon, Quezon Combat Base. It was basically a big base on a plateau that the Marines held just a few miles from the border of North Vietnam. The Vietnamese surrounded it. They wanted to pull another Dien Bien Phu, right? They surrounded the whole base and began pummeling it and trying to take it. The good news for America, Unlike the French, we built our base on top of the mountain, not in the valley. So Quezon was on top of a plateau, not in a hole. So enemy artillery was not going to be able to pummel it like it did um, Dien Bien Phu. Also, American air power was a little stronger than, than French air power had been back in the day. We held on to Quezon. Um, if anybody has played Call of Duty Black Ops, which I realize at this point is getting to be quite the old video game, but the original Black Ops, there is uh, a couple missions if I remember that involve, or there's at least one I know that involves Quezon. Um, we held on to that, though. Now, <clears throat> the fighting for the city of Hue was covered on the news on the regular. It took several weeks for American troops to retake the city of Hue. If you've ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, the urban fighting is in the city of Hue. Basically, the second half of that movie, when they go to Vietnam, takes place in Hue almost exclusively. And there's this photo, though. Okay? This is the South Vietnamese chief of police. This is a Viet Cong guerrilla that they had captured. That's a 38. And that's 
This guy getting shot in the head with his hands tied behind his back. This is a still photo. There is video of this. I'm not linking it up here. Um, you can find it if you're really desperate to find it. But American journalists captured the South Vietnamese chief of police shooting an unarmed Viet Cong prisoner, hands tied behind his back, in the head, in the middle of the street, during the Tet Offensive. This photo goes back to what I was saying previously. For a lot of Americans, what are we doing there? What are we doing supporting people who do this? He's a prisoner. Is that how Americans operate? Do we do we execute prisoners in the street like that? You know? And, and if you watch the, the film, I mean, it's so nonchalant and casual, and everybody just kind of steps back so he can go do it. And after he does it, it's like nothing happened. It's like he squashed an ant. Um, it's, it's very disturbing and troubling. But again, Americans saw that. This wasn't something the military covered up. This isn't a photo that I discovered 30 years later. Americans saw this the very day it happened, basically. Um, and so people, of course, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, whatever. And that's the thing. Tet, okay, if you look at it, militarily, who won Tet? We did. We took back every city. We held on to Quezon. We annihilated the Viet Cong. Truth be told, the Viet Cong ceased to be a fighting force after Tet. We annihilated the Viet Cong and Tet. They took so many casualties that they were unable to really participate as an independent fighting force for the rest of the war. Um, you know, we, our commanders bragged. You know, the enemy had spent months planning this sneak attack, getting things in position, moving people. They launched dozens of attacks simultaneously, and they failed to hold on to a single objective. We took back every city. We held on to every major military position. We killed tens of thousands of the enemy, right? We were on vacation, and they sneak attacked us. They Pearl Harbored us, and they didn't knock us out. We knocked them out. We won, and we did. But then you got to ask yourself, who won politically in Tet? Politically, the winner of Tet was the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, the Congress. Why? Because... For three years now, the enemy is bankrupt, light at the end of the tunnel, any day now, we've crossed over all these other things, right? You know, for quite some time now. I've been hearing about body count. I've been getting all these statistics and, and all these wonderful you know, results, supposedly, and I'm getting all these press conferences. And the enemy launches a massive sneak attack that required tens of thousands of troops. An enemy that does this is not on the brink of defeat. An enemy that surrounds the Marines at Quezon and besieges Quezon for two months, right, is not on the brink of defeat. An enemy who blows a hole in my embassy wall and shoots it up for several hours is not on the brink of defeat. And so that is the credibility gap becomes the credibility Grand Canyon at this point, right? There's actually, sorry to take a segue real quick. There is film of Marines fighting along a wall like this in Hue. And this was broadcast on the news. And there's a bunch of Marines standing up firing over the wall. And all of a sudden, one Marine's head jerks back and he falls. He gets shot in the head. Americans watch that. All right? We watch that happen on the nightly news. Okay? Again, that these guys don't look like guys who are on their way to victory. These are guys who are just glad that they made it through yesterday and they're hoping to make it through today. All right? And so the credibility gap is, is irreparable. Politically, the enemy won Tet. They destroyed American support for the Vietnam War. Here you go. Here's Tet. Right? Here's Tet. And look at the numbers after Tet. They start falling down, right? There was a little resurgence in April of 68. I can't really place why in the younger crowd. But look, the middle-aged crowd and the older crowd, they're never coming back. Ages 30 to 49 never go back above 46%, right? There's one 46. They never hit 45% ever again. 
And these people never get over four. They never even get over 35. After Tet, the older crowd never gets back above 35% supporting the Vietnam War. All right. I mean, look at that. After Tet, it's over. If you want to talk about support for the war in this country. Okay. So while it might have been a military failure, in the long run, it was a victory for the South, for the North Vietnamese, excuse me, the North Vietnamese. All right. The credibility gap is too far to repair now, right? The president's approval rating plummets. Um, and America's media, by the way, began to really openly criticize and question, too. For example, Walter Cronkite, a name that might not mean much to you guys, but he was, he was a newsman everyone respected, everyone trusted back then, right? Walter Cronkite, on the nation's you know, news, said, after the Tet Offensive, it seemed more certain than ever that the bloody experience in Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. Other newspapermen or journalists wrote, the American people should be getting ready to accept, if they haven't already, the prospect that the whole Vietnam effort may be doomed. Right? So much for victory is at hand. So much for the enemy's hopes are bankrupt. Okay? Here you go. In this poll, they ask people, is the war in Vietnam a mistake? And you'll notice that early on, no, it's not a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. No, Tet. There's Tet right there. And then you always have the group who are like, I don't know what you're talking about. But look, the percentage of Americans who feel that the war is a mistake hits the 50% mark right after Tet. And it always stays at or above 50%. Tet killed America's belief that we could help win Vietnam. President Johnson realized he's done. Um, there's no chance for him to win re-election in 1968. He won a grand slam in 64, but there's no chance in 1968 now that this has happened. Um, even before Tet, in November of 1967, Eugene McCarthy, a Dove senator from Minnesota, announced he was going to challenge President Johnson for re-election. Right? He was going to openly challenge the sitting president for the nomination. It wasn't long after that that Robert Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's brother, announced he was going to run. In March of 68, during Tet, McCarthy won more than 40% of the votes in the New Hampshire primary. Okay? Almost beating President Johnson in that primary. And that's when Senator Robert Kennedy also announced his candidacy. That's why on March 31st, President Johnson announced he would not seek re-election. He basically announced, I'm not running for president in 1968. I'm going to focus on doing the job that I have left. I'm not doing it. Okay, so we know we're going to get a change in leadership in this fall. That summer, though, things are going to get bad. That summer, Martin Luther King Jr. will be assassinated in Tennessee. Um, when he was uh, down in uh, Memphis to lead a sanitation worker protest. He's assassinated. There were riots all across the nation, race riots primarily, all across the nation that April. Um, that summer, Robert Kennedy, who just had won the California Democratic primary and, and seemed to be the front runner for the Democratic Party at that point, he is walking out of the hotel kitchen to go out a back exit to get in his limo to leave. After giving his victory speech, he's assassinated by an Arab nationalist named Sirhan Sirhan because he had been, uh, he made pro-Israeli remarks. Um, and so the front runner for the Democratic Party is murdered. So we got the leader of the civil rights movement assassinated, the leader, the leading candidate for the Democrats assassinated all, you know, that summer. And it's only going to continue to get worse. There are going to be a number of race riots all across the country that summer. Just like there were a bunch of years in the 1960s, as we'll learn about when we get there. Okay? Things are only going to get worse. In August of 1968, there's a full-blown riot outside the Democratic Convention in Chicago. The Democratic National Convention that year was in Chicago. There is a full-on riot outside the doors of the convention hall. Some protesters break their way in and disrupt it. It's just pure chaos. All right? Eventually... The Democrats nominate Hubert Humphrey. Okay, it was a, a difficult path to the nomination, um, but the Democrats nominated Hubert Humphrey. Again, not their first choice, but you know they had to nominate somebody for the for the election. 
Uh, they chose President Johnson's vice president um, out of all the people, right? Now, <clears throat> on the Republican side of things, you've got Richard Nixon. That's right. Don't call it a comeback. He never left. After barely losing to John F. Kennedy in 1960, Richard Nixon wisely sat out the 1964 election knowing that no one was going to beat Lyndon Johnson, so he wasn't going to waste his political clout. And then he, swoop, he swooped in in 1968 to save America. Um, don't forget there's a third-party candidate this time around, Alabama Governor George Wallace, who's an independent segregationist. For those of you who are curious, this is the man who stood on the steps of the Alabama State Capitol one time and said proudly, and I say segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. He's also the guy in the movie Forrest Gump that blocks some African Americans from entering the University of Alabama. If you're not sure what he's running on, he's a racist. Um, he's not really going to win across the country, but he's there to shift the election to a more segregationist move. As you'll see, he's only popular in the South. Um, but it, So it's really Richard Nixon versus Hubert Humphrey. If anything, George Wallace should help out Richard Nixon, because if you look at history, these people vote Democrat, right? Um, the... Actually, 64 showed us that there was a change occurring. We're not going to talk about that right now. That's for a different lecture. Um, but, you know, historically, this region of the country is very, very Democrat. So if there's a candidate taking away votes down here, it's probably going to benefit the Republican, right? So if anything, George Wallace is helping Richard Nixon. Um, but in this campaign... Richard Nixon says he's got a plan to end the war, right? He has a plan. He, he's going to get us out of Vietnam. What's the plan, Rich? It's a secret. Obviously, Richard Nixon's not going to tell you his plan during the campaign. He's going to keep it a secret. you got to elect him to find out. I will say that Richard Nixon um, famously said that he was running to represent the silent majority, right? He said, look, I realize that every time you turn on the news, you see one of these things. But let's be real. That's not the bulk of America. The bulk of America aren't protesters. The bulk of America aren't demonstrators. The bulk of America is what? Going to work, paying its taxes, quietly living its lives. And I'm going to fight for those people, right? I'm going to bring an end to this chaos in Vietnam, and I'm going to get this country back together, back in order, right? I'm going to bring us together, as he famously said. Now, Hubert Humphrey, gentlemen... Um, of course, is shackled in part because he had been the vice president of the man who got us sucked into Vietnam. Um, so even when Hubert Humphrey's like, I'm going to end Vietnam, people are like, no, you're not. You worked for Lyndon Johnson and, you know, you didn't stop him back then. Um, right before the election, President Johnson tried to help Hubert Humphrey by saying he was going to stop the bombing in North Vietnam and that there would be peace talks. It came too late. On election day, Richard Nixon defeated Hubert Humphrey by more than 100 electoral votes, although his win in the popular vote was very slim, 43 to 42. In the popular vote, it was only a one percentage difference, the rest being picked up by George Wallace. Um, Wallace, by the way, one of the most successful third-party candidates of all time. He won 46 electoral votes, 13 percent of the popular vote. Um, <clears throat> got a county by county in there, McCoy. You know I do. You'll see Richard Nixon. He's popular everywhere. But Hubert Humphrey, right? We're seeing a little bit more of a mixture than we're used to. We're used to maps where large chunks are one color or another. You can see this one is, you know, well, yeah, we got large chunk out here. But it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a runaway. It wasn't a walk-off. That's why sometimes this map is misleading. And sometimes the county by county is a little bit nicer. Because you can see there were, there were glimmers. There were glimmers out west for Hubert Humphrey. Not enough, but glimmers. Um, and so as you can see, Southern support for Hubert Humphrey was weak. There's not a lot of dark blue. There's some dark red in the heart of the, and that's the other thing. Neither candidate really knocked it out the park either direction. California, Richard Nixon's from California, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't knock it out the park. Hubert Humphrey is from Minnesota, but look at that. He didn't knock it out the park. And so, um, <clears throat> It's, it's, it's an election that shows you America is fully divided. Vietnam, 
has destroyed all all unity in this country, it seems. We're divided every which way you can imagine. The Richard Nixon says he's going to bring us together. He's going to end the war in Vietnam. How's he going to do that? We'll cover that in our next lecture.